of working with that for a bit, it's like, oh, wow, I can teach. I really can, like, even though it's really, really intense. And, um, and then you reach this weird kind of oasis, plateau, desert thing of, of, of boredom or ignorance or something like that, vanilla. Like, it's the most difficult one. It seems to go on forever. I don't, I don't think I've fully processed it yet. And it all started in class um, one day when, I'm, for some stupid reason, I was talking about pianos, you know, as you do. And I was like, well, does anyone know like, when the piano was invented? And one person in the back piped up and said, why should I care? You know, so in California, right, where they're all willing to kind of, they're sort of looking at you with like a, holding an invisible remote. You know, they're just like, entertain me or I'm going to change the channel, you know. And it really hurt my feelings. I said, why should I care? Then I suddenly realized, oh, right, it's one of those messages from the universe about whatever. Why should I, why should I care? Like, why should I, Tim? be so intense all the time, you know, and it reminded me of what this very beautiful graffiti I saw, no graffiti, how funny, calligraphy that I saw in Boulder, Colorado, um, what, someone had written the word careless, but they'd written it in two words, care, care less, care less, right, in other words, like, you, you sort of light touch, you know, and sort of allow people to not know what they're thinking, not know what you're thinking, not know what you're doing a little bit, you know, you can tell I've been practicing this really a lot, right? Um, so that, at that point, you realize, actually, you know what? You don't have to be a teacher. Like, because, like, the initial phase is, like, oh, my God, I have to be a teacher. I have to be a special teacher. This is a special thing that I have to be. I've got to be this thing. And then you suddenly realize, actually, you don't have to be a teacher because you are a teacher, right? This gets even worse when you become a parent, right? Like, for the first few years, I was trying to be a dad, of, 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 of Claire, who's now 13. And um, I found my dad, my, my world, my apparently my world of Tim, like gradually, gradually shrinking to like a sort of one meter radius circle in the house, you know. Um, and then finally realizing, you know what, this wasn't really my house in the first place. And like, from her point of view, it's her house, right? Like 20 years later, it's like, this is my house, right? It, is, it, it never was my house. Um, and then you sort of realize, at least me, I realize you, you don't have to be a dad, right? You don't have to be, you don't have to be, a, be a dad because you are a dad, yeah? Like noticing already, some, some, something's already happening. One person in the room knows that you're their dad, right? Like one person in the room knows that you're the teacher. You don't have to hold that, you know? You don't have to kind of hold that piece and do something really, really special. And the trouble is that we keep telling ourselves in all kinds of different ways, I think, in the media in particular, that we have to be something different, you know, or, or somehow there's this sort of message that we've got to sort of be ecological, and it's this big kind of stumbling block, and it sounds so complicated and difficult, and we get into this weird thing where, you know, um, um, sort of uh, like what happens when I go to sometimes to study Buddhism, you know, and in the um, Q&A, Someone's going to be like, but, but how? How do we get there? You know, and it's sort of like um, performing, like I'm a really good person because I'm lacerating myself in public. And um, I'm also like performing like I, I need absolution or some kind of special voice from elsewhere to kind of rubber stamp me. Like you are an okay person, right? You're an okay Buddhist, you know. Um, and that's kind of very inhibiting of actually realizing that what's really cool is like, noticing something that's already the case, right? And what, what's already the case is that you're a, an embodied biological being that lives in a biosphere with this incredible bacterial microbiome and so on um, that's sort of symbiotically related to all these other life forms in this incredibly fragile but very, very beautiful and um, dynamic way, right, that, that, that could easily kind of get, like, destroyed, you know, or, or reconfigured in some way. And so I sort of thought, um, what if I tried to write a book that sort of helped people to not, relax isn't quite the right word, but like get some kind of quiet, more quiet, quiet, like metaphorically quiet, but maybe also literally quality about how we talk to ourselves and, e and, and each other about ecology. Because I don't know about you, but I feel like when I look at the paper, I'm being yelled at. Right, in, in, in two different modes, like on the front page, as it were, it's like two, a hundred thousand, five percent, six, and every day there's another bunch of these sorts of uh, factoid-like bits of information, right, 
that seemingly are like raw, like raw data. Data is never really raw, you know. Like data is already like an interpretation, right? Like, oh, look, there's three people in that picture. You know, that's already an interpretation, right? So, like, the idea that there's just this brutal thing out there that we've got to become aware of, and then the next day it's a whole other bunch of factoids that you have to absorb, you know, and it's sort of like, I don't think we really need one more of those sorts of ways of talking to ourselves to, to kind of help, you know, and, and, and sort of like the, 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 the quite religious approach, which is the other thing, which is the editorial, right? Like, so on the editorial section, there's this kind of Jeremiah quality, like, if we don't, then, then oh, we're very bad, evil, you know. Um, and unfortunately, I saw full respect to ev anyone who actually does this for a proper job. But some of it, thank you for laughing, some of it is a bit, you know, on the religious side. Is it really ecological speech or is it actually like religion speech, but like really well justified by scientific factoids? Like this isn't just about Jesus, this is about like ice and reality and stuff that you have in your fridge, you know. And so like you, so like, you can be really, really intense with people. You know, and is that really ecological speech? And, and maybe like we could try something more gentle, you know, not necessarily like Namby Pamby. Like I feel like um, gentle could be very disturbing. I love this thing that Theodore Adorno says about Proust. You know, I teach in this school where um, if you if you tell your students, you know, one of these days you may really might like to read A la Recherche du Temps Perdu. It's quite good. Then two days later, they've all read Swan's Way. You know, it's really embarrassing. Um, and Adorno says, um, Proust, like, destroys the aristocracy, unquote, with remorseless gentleness. I think that's really beautiful. Yeah, like, gentle doesn't have to be, like, um, non-violent in a kind of I'm just going to let anything happen to me way. Yeah. Um, so, like, instead of being in this kind of very reactive sort of PTSD mode, about it, where we're kind of constantly re-traumatizing ourselves. And I don't, I don't know about you, I can only really think about this stuff for real, for like one second a day, otherwise I begin to lose it. I can feel myself going there now, because I'm starting to, I'm talking about it. You know, it's really, really horrible, isn't it? It's really horrible. And so, how to not die, you know, I'm very keen on like, how to not psychologically die, especially because like right now, curling up in the fetal position and going, oh, my God, is that, that's actually not just not helping, that's sort of contributing to the problem, right? And sort of like how to not die without, like, getting into this incredible ag 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 aggression mode that we're so often in about it, you know? And so I wrote this book, and, and I feel like, um, you know, Penguin gave me this beautiful golden microphone to, to sort of help people in whatever clumsy way I know how. And that's the way I know how, right? Like, that's my, that's my little bit. But actually, what the book really is, is me um, curating this piece by Yoko Ono. Because when I was 12 years old, John Lennon was assassinated. And uh, I Imagine went to number one again, the, 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 and the video went to number one in the charts, yeah, on top of the pops, I saw it for the first time. Maybe it was the first time I ever got, like, scared by a work of art. I like being a little bit scared by art, yeah. Um, and, you know, in the video, John and Yoko are walking down the pathway towards their mansion, and, you, and that beautiful, still, kind of scarily simple piano tune is playing, and the opening lyric, very simple, imagine there's no heaven, and you're going through the front door there, and above the front door is a little bit of Yoko's Fluxus piece called This Is Not Here, right? And I just thought, oh, wow, that's amazing, yeah. Um, and then a few years later, I read this book called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by Shunryu Suzuki. And in the middle of that, there's like completely unexplained, two blank pages and like this drawing of a fly. So you're reading sort of Zen Zen, interesting meditation. Whoa, the, what? Huh? And then, you know, nothing. So I'm afraid this is a bit of a spoiler here, but like right, right in the middle of this is that I, I persuaded Yoko to put this in. So in fact, what this book really is, is Tim you know, like curating this piece by Yoko. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, so there's so there's so much to get into. Actually, I'm I'm just I'm wondering where the best place to start is. In a way, because. 
So I think maybe at the beginning, um, you point to uh, the dawn of the agricultural age and monotheism mm -hmm. as sort of where it all went wrong, in a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and would you like to just expand on that a little bit? And maybe it just made me wonder whether in order for us to realize that we are ecological, but to live that and feel that and be it, mm -hmm. Does that mean we need to somehow get beyond mm. the agricultural age mm. and monotheism? In which case, I can see a few mm. practical obstacles. Yes, right, exactly. Um, okay, so one first thing to say, actually, is that ecological awareness involves, you know, realizing that there's thousands of different scales on which things are happening, right? Like now, you know, now could be, you know, like the, the, within this hour, what we're doing here, or it could be like this century or it could be the time of humans on Earth, right? Or it could be the time of the solar system. It could be, right? Like, when was the poem written? Was it written in 1810? Was it written in the 19th century? Was it written in, you know, so the, there's all these different scales that you can look at things on. And so um, looking at this scale, this is a historical scale. This is not outside of history. This is actually just like really big scale historical fact, right? Which is that we live in this kind of Mesopotamian post-Mesopotamian type society, right? Um, where we, 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 I like to say we, and it's very bad, and I shouldn't do it. Um, and I wrote this book about why we sort of have to do it. Um, and um, it's sort of about um, establishing a kind of uh, safety um, against, you know, what was at that point global warming, actually. There was, a, there was the geological period called the Holocene, right? There was this mild global warming then, you know, so basically all of your lunch ran away. So where do you go to get, so what do you do? Well, like, let's store things up for next time and like start planning and let's create kind of like a city type thing. Let's sort of settle down, right? And like, so there's this kind of implicit logistical, logistical, like how to make things happen structure going on. And it's kind of been running in the background like an operating system for 12 and a half thousand years, whether we've been living in like feudalism, Soviet, capitalist or whatever type of a society, there's been this kind of basic model which has very much to do with kind of somewhat cutting off human beings from non-human beings, some non-human beings, um, and defining those non-human beings as like um, nature in some way. And nature's like this thing over there, you know, or, or, or under here or somewhere in here, but it's not, it's not this, it's somewhere else, yeah? Um, I think that the idea that we need to kind of, like, get over that or go somewhere else or do something, the, the, the trouble is the way we talk to ourselves about it is in the key of we've got to go from here to there and, like, that's that model where there's a here and there's a, and there's a there is structuring, is how the agricultural, like, Mesopotamian space is structured, right? So we're still asking that question the way we're asking it in, like inside of the space, yeah? And I'm very keen on this idea, like, I keep saying it to myself, um, the how is the what, right? Like, the how, um, it's really from fun boy three. So it, it's sort of what you, it's not what you do, it's the way that you do it, you know? But like, the how is very much what, like, like you can say all kinds of words. I know my, one of my friends says very rude words, but in a way that's so gentle and good. You know, it's, they're not like aggression, they're, they're, they're not using an aggressive way, right? It's like that, right? Um, so the how, you know, um, and so one way you could hear what I'm saying, for example, is to be like, we have to completely dismantle civilization and go back to some state of primitive something. And that idea that there was a pre, whatever that was, state, you know, which is encoded into a lot of religions, actually, is also a thought, like the way that's thought is totally a symptom of being inside of this kind of agricultural space. And in particular, like, religion is like the 1.0 way in which that space kind of d explains itself to itself. And um, maybe philosophy is, Western philosophy is like the 2.0 version. There's nothing wrong with agriculture in particular, though. I mean, there's all kinds of different forms of agriculture. There's all kinds of, like, nomadic, hunter-gathering, whatever types of agriculture, different types of models of it, right? So it's not exactly agriculture. It's not really what, what, whatever they call domestication, you know. I'm being a little bit stalked sometimes by John Zerzan, who's like an anarcho-primitivist guy who, who who's edits the Unabomber, you know. 
Um, and he's like, well, you very nearly say what I'm saying, but you don't, so that's wrong. Um, and that's the thing. I don't really want to say what he's saying. You know, like, I don't really want to do that. So picking up on something you touched on there is obviously a big part of where, what you're explaining in the book is how difficult it is for us to think about things when we're not even aware that the way we are thinking about mm -hmm. things is the problem we need to stop. Mm -hmm. um, and it's deeply embedded. Uh, and mm -hmm. so you have to, in a way, try quite hard to, to, to get around that. But mm -hmm. I, you also said something about Western philosophy and thinking. Mm -hmm. So would you say that there are um, you know, differences culturally? I mean, I don't know to what extent mm -hmm. you, you've seen how, are there other cultures which find it easier to be ecological, to be sort of quieter and calmer or, um, you know, oh, for more gentle? Say totally, yeah, absolutely, right. The trouble is that as, as a white guy, when I say that, it sounds very wrong, like I'm appropriating something. Um, and the trouble is then, you know, some people say you shouldn't say stuff like that, which might imply you should just say wrong white man stuff so we know who to attack, right? It's like, I don't really want, I don't really like this feature of myself. And like, um, um, what I say inevitably ends up sounding like something that maybe uh, in, indigenous people might say, you know? Um, and I, th I think it's okay. And, and, and I think that... Um, um, people will sound more like that in 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 future, with with any luck, you know, um, and that that's not necessarily a, a not good thing, you know. One one thing to say here, just randomly, is you're not guilty, you know. Like like if I was going to reduce it to one phrase, it would be, please don't feel guilt anymore for one more second about anything to do with ecological anything, right? Because Ecological anything is scaled to something much bigger than guilt, right? Like, guilt is scaled to, to individuals, right? And, like, human beings are destroying Earth on a, on a species level, right? Like, when I start my car, I'm really not harming Earth. I'm really, you're, you're really not doing that. When you, when you do that, you're not actually doing anything to the biosphere statistically meaningfully at all. It's statistically meaningless. Billions and billions of those mean something. Right, so that's weird because, like, as an individual, nothing's happening, but like, as this big, big thing distributed across space and time called human species, something very, very bad is happening um, called mass extinction. You know, like, if you're really going to call it by what it is, if you're going to slightly like um, massage it, it's called global warming, and much more massage it's climate change. You know, so, so what we're really dealing with here is mass extinction. Um, and the point is to, you, we're responsible for it, right? Like, I want to make sure people understand, like, responsibility and guilt is different, right? And, like, if you can understand something, you're responsible for it. That's the point. It's like, we shouldn't be trying to convince anyone anymore that we don't even need to prove that humans did global warming to anyone, right? Like, even if crocodiles did it, if we can understand it, we're responsible for it, right? It's, like, it's super easy, right? It's sort of like... You see somebody about to be run over, you understand that's going to happen, you're responsible for that situation, right? It's like, you don't have to prove that you did it, you don't have to feel guilty for one second that you set this up, you know, you're just responsible because you can understand it, right? Like, so if you can understand something, you're responsible for it, please don't feel guilty, you know? That, I'm, I'm saying this as a guilt specialist, it's my favourite hobby. <laughs> so, but yeah. can, can we actually let ourselves off the hook individually? Because you talk about the paradox of heaps, right? This is sort of the, the grain of the idea that um, we know that there's a heap of sand. If you keep taking grains of sand away, when does it stop becoming a heap of sand? Um, and, and the answer is that you can't identify that point, right? So at the same, if as a species, we are causing a mass extinction. Yeah. At what point does species sort of reduce to individual mm -hmm. action? Mm -hmm. um, the trouble is, that we think of things like species as like this big, big whole thing that like swallows us like Pac-Man, you know, like we, that's what we think of holes are. We think they're these sort of Pac-Man beings that like, like oceans that just kind of boom and we're like just these droplets in the ocean because we've got this idea that the, um, that's the ocean calling right now. Um, <laughs> see how I'm doing. Um, we've got this idea that the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts. And for some reason, we keep on retweeting it, like, wow, this is so clever, you know, 
I'm so clever by, by performing that, oh, you know and I know that the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts, right? Yeah, you know. And, and like, has it ever, have, you, have you ever actually read anyone, like, prove it? And, like, so many different thinkers get into this. Like, say, for example, Marx. He's like, like when you have enough factories making enough bits of other factories, poof, it's called industrial capitalism. If you'd known the word emergence, you would have saved a lot of space for that capital. could have been, like, one sentence. Um, but it's quite nice because it's a great big novel, isn't it? Um, so it sort of gets everywhere. And I think it m pr produces this problem of, like, how to go from an individual to a uh, collective, you know, politically and ethically, as well as just, like, understanding the world, you know. Um, so I was teaching about cities in this class in architecture a, f a couple of years ago, and I suddenly heard this word coming out of my mouth, this, fr this idea, um, because it's very difficult, actually, to point to megacities. It's weird. Like, London, urban architects find it very hard to point to it. Like, where does it start? Where does it stop, right? Houston's the third biggest city in the USA. That's where I live. It's a mega city, you know, like tens of millions of people. Um, and I suddenly started thinking, what if the whole was actually less than the sum of its parts? Right, like just, just for a laugh, why not flip it upside down? And then I suddenly started thinking, actually, that's a really empowering idea, right? Because instead of saying society doesn't exist, there are only individuals, which is the, other, you know, the only other choice you've got. You can either be this free theistic ho holist in which the whole swallows and dissolves little you, or you can be this kind of there is no such thing as society type Thatcher type person, right? And like, what if you wanted to be a holist? Because, you know, ecological awareness is made out of like holism, I think. You know, but what if like the, 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 the one you have to keep buying into is this very theistic thing that is basically like this whole is always much, much bigger and badder and more real and better than, right? And it, it's all based on this idea of omnipresence, right? Like, or, or, or omnipotence or something like that, which has to do with like, you know, some white guy with a beard who wants to kill you. And, in the sky and all that, you know. Um, and so my, my, my thought about that is that actually, yes, of course, I'm a symptom of the human species, right? Like in, a, like, in that sense, like, I'm a symptom of the biosphere, right? I'm a symptom of the Big Bang, right? Like, in, in a way, like, this room is just the current state of the Big Bang, right? Um, so, but that doesn't exhaust what I am, right? Like, like... I'm also this freaked out person wearing shoes talking to you. You know, that, that's nothing in particular to do with being a member of the human species that's destroying Earth in particular, you know. So, like, weather is a symptom of climate, right? Like, obviously, everything that happens is happening because of global warming. Like, did it happen because of global warming? Yeah, because the global warming is the bigger scale thing and in which, like, all the other stuff's happening, yeah? There's no need to worry about it, right? Um, but the thing is that weather does so much more than just being a symptom of, of global warming, right? It's, the, it's, it's this lovely soft sensation on my skin. It's this bath for these toads, you know, outside my house, right? And so, like, um, what Shelley said, you know, like, Gandhi and King, inspired by this poem called The Mask of Anarchy that says, we are many, they are few, right? That's actually not just politically great and sort of historically accurate at the moment, it's ontologically correct, right? That means having to do with how things are at all. That's what ontology means, like the study of how things are, right? Like, I can't tell you what exists, but I can tell you, like, how they exist. Yeah, that's ontology, right? And how they exist is that they exist all in the same way, right? So if there are things like football players, maybe, you know, then if there are things like football teams, right, Football team exists in the same way as a football player, right? Football team is, there's one of them. There's lots of players in the football team. Therefore, the whole is always less than the sum of its parts. And I can see on your face that automatically hit delete on the idea. So that's the most simple and therefore the most stupid idea I ever heard in my life. What's the <laughs> other? Right? And that's interesting because it makes perfect sense. But you hit delete on it. It's like, why? What's this tendency to want to delete that, right? So we've got the controls down here on this level. There's so much more kind of oozing out of me than me, right? Like, so much of this stuff isn't Tim, right? Like, there's not a little 
Intel Inside sticker in everything in here that says, this is a Tim Morton pair of pants, this is a Tim Morton bit of DNA, this is a Tim Morton idea, this is a Tim Morton genome, right? There's so much other stuff, right? There's so much more bacterial DNA, right, in a way. So, like, there's so much less of Tim, which is awesome, right? Like, Tim's real, but he's not real, like, real, you know, like, real, you know. But he's, he's not like Donald Trump real, yeah. <laughs> Thank God. So, <laughs> so, so you managed to work Donald Trump in that. So, um, Sorry about that. I promised myself never to say the name, and I found, <laughs> I found myself saying it. Uh, I, one of the things I quite like, so getting on to the ontology, I, I, you make a point, but it's quite subversive, and we sit here in, in a sort of grand room of the Enlightenment era, where you know reason and science and logic and so on, and certainly well, absolute elegant. objectivity. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're watching you. Um, you, you make the simple point that, you know, the way in which a badger might be accessing uh, a, a tree as it, as mm. it what snuffles around the bottom of it is equally valid to mm. the way that you or I might be accessing that mm -hmm. tree and experiencing it. Of course, we are trained to think that, you know, we are other from nature, mm. we are masters and dominion, you know, we have dominion yes. over it. Um, it's, it's quite mm. difficult to overcome that, isn't it? And you make the point, mm. interestingly, that it's less scientific to be like that mm. than it would be to be ecological, in fact. Yes, so, absolutely. Funnily right. enough, living in a scientific age means we have stopped believing in authoritative truth. Uh -huh. That kind of truth is pretty medieval, always backed up by the threat of violence, because it can't be proved. You just have to believe it. Mm. So, uh, mm. I, 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 you, because you're talking about the way we know things mm. and the way things are, that mm. obviously naturally makes you think about, and you've mentioned Trump, so here we mm. go, we're talking about post-truth. Let's do it. So, <laughs> you were talking about the domain of um, mm. uh, how we can be ecological, so it's uh, it, it, how we mm. can live with this mass extinction that collectively, you know, mm. it, it's, it's not, as you say, it's not the turtles that have caused us, not mm. the crocodiles, it's us. Mm. Um, but in a different domain of politics, um, mm -hmm. a lot of people are feeling very, uh, I think, uneasy about mm. the idea that there's not really a thing called truth. Mm -hmm. Can you translate anything across to help people sort of deal yes. with that from what you've written here? I'm so glad you asked me that question. <laughs> um, so, like, okay, so, so like in the same way with the holism, let's go from this kind of explosive capital T truth thing to like a small t truth. Like, actually, reason is awesome, right? Like, licking things is awesome, thinking about them accurately is awesome, drinking them is awesome, ignoring them is awesome. There's nothing in particular about thinking that's like better than. Licking, it doesn't get like at the glass better than licking it or, or drinking it. If I drink the glass, I have a glass drink. If I think about the glass, I have a glass thought. If, I, if, if the glass goes on Oprah and becomes sentient and starts talking about itself, it has a glass autobiography, right? Like that nothing in particular completely does the total glass at any moment, right? And so um, that doesn't mean that this is a potato. Right, it's a glass, and it, 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 it's made of sand, and it's been made by someone who blew the glass or moulded it or whatever. And there are some very accurate things you can say about it. So it's not that there's no truth, right? It's that there is this truth, right? The trouble with the Enlightenment, in a way, was not the what, but the how, right? Because the how that that thing was delivered in, this notion of reason being cool, was in the key of humans are the best at accessing stuff, because thinking about stuff is definitely better than licking it. And the best accessors of all are like these white guys, right? Like the, like the, the default accessor, like if you scratch the surface of anybody, you find this white guy underneath. Like everybody's a man with a capital M and some of them are women and blah, 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 blah. All that stuff, right, that's obviously whack, yeah? Um, so um, I think about this a lot about because of the fake news problem, you know, and, and, and I don't know, post-truth, I, maybe I don't like so much. It's just this notion of fake news, and I tell you what's interesting to me about fake news. Fake news, you can totally tell fake news from news news, you really can. And I'm going to tell you how. Like, um, if, if what you're reading or whatever believes and insists com like that it's really, 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 really true, it's fake news, right? Fake news believes that true and false are really different. Here's this paradox, right? Like, Actual news news is tolerating some ambiguity, a.k.a. true and false might not be that different. That sounds really wrong. That sounds like post-truth, but actually, funnily enough, 
that kind of ambiguity is the space in which, like, really true things can be said, right? Like, I don't know about you, but I feel like my life is about learning to tolerate higher and higher levels of ambiguity so that I don't even really know necessarily, like, what side I'm on in particular when I'm thinking about something, you know, and that doesn't even necessarily feel like a good thing anymore. As it used to feel quite righteous about it a while ago, sort of like now I'm even older, it's like, oh my God, you can't really even justify it, you know. So I feel like believing that true and false are really different, you know, that in other words there's capital T true and it's really different from capital F false, is precisely the fake news mode, right? And like news news is news that, that, that has some ambiguity. That doesn't necessarily mean um, like really solidified skepticism, right? Which could also be a form of true. Like I remember during the second Iraq war, 2003, listening to the BBC thinking, ah, oh, this is how the British do the propaganda through the skepticism, right? Like the hotel was bombed, says the reporter, and then the anchor's like, are you sure? Were you there? Can you totally prove it that you were there? Well, I wasn't completely there, and I'm not completely sure. So, ah, well, you know, probably it wasn't then. You know? um, so you can even use that kind of scepticism as a kind of capital T true thing, because it's, like, it, it, it's about the how rather than the what, right? Like how you think ambiguity, right? Ambiguous doesn't mean vague either. Ambiguous means really, really accurate. Who's ever been to the opticians, right? So when you go to the opticians, they get it down eventually to a choice between two quite good but essentially slightly crappy solutions, right? And, the, and, and, the, and they're like, is it number one or number two? Is it number one or number two? And you're like, number one is like slightly wrong in this way and number two slightly wrong in that way and I can't really decide between them because my decision process is a bit shit and the doctor's a bit crappy and glasses are a bit crappy because everything's finite, right? Like eyes are finite and medical devices are finite. They've all got these limitations. So you've got it down to about as accurate as it's, it's going to be, right? And you've got these two choices. What does that mean, right? What is that? That's ambiguity, ambo. It means on both sides, right? So it's like two or more choices that you can't decide. That means you have an accurate prescription, right? So like ambiguity isn't vagueness. Ambiguity is an accuracy signal. You know, and, and, and like if we had five hours, I'd go on to my new discovery, which is that irony is a reality signal. You know, it's not about like escaping from, you know, into some kind of postmodern, you know, escape velocity from everything thing. It's, it, it's actually about noticing that there is a reality, you know. So, so, so yeah, ambiguity is an accuracy signal. Noticing that um, you said it in, in your opening remarks, noticing what is already the case. Um, and we've talked a bit about reasoning and, 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 and that, but actually I, I think you strongly make the point that um, it's all the other ways we might notice. So uh, it might be as important to... Uh, I'm, in, in my team we're doing a research project about artificial intelligence. Is it just as important to watch films about artificial intelligence or write poems about artificial intelligence as for us yeah. to do traditional yes. wonky, you know, sort of yeah. reasoning research? Yeah. Uh, I, th I, I think so in, 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 in terms of ecological ethics and politics and awareness domains, right? That actually, you know, um, not just knowing it is very important somehow, you know? Um, when, when that gets said, often it gets said in the way of, you know, um, if only I could become more touchy-feely, like really, like the most anti-intellectual anti people in the world are people like me, right? Because they've got this kind of guilt trip about being so intellectual. So they're like, intellectual's really bad, and I've got all these reasons why. Read my book, I've got all these footnotes, and intellectual reasons why intellectualism is very bad. Um, and, you know, there's this other thing you can do which is much better, right? And so, like, having been in many situations in which that's been really enforced, you know, because I used to live in Boulder, Colorado, um, Enough said. Um, but like, um, I'm, I, I like sticking up for like intellect and thinking. There's nothing wrong with thinking in particular, you know. Um, it's more like um, the way in which we do it in public with each other about ecological stuff. In a funny way, it, it, it's like it's not enough thoughtful, um, and maybe it's it's again it's a little bit more religious than thinking. Yeah, and. Um, I don't know about you, 
but for me, thinking is a very physical act, right? Like, so I deliberately wrote this book after breakfast, right? Because for some reason I was writing two books at the same time. You know, so don't do it. But don't, don't do that thing. Um, I'm having a bit of a hard time. Um, and so I thought, this book is a book all about, like, like, taking your foot off the gas pedal and being a bit contemplative. And I'm going to write it in the morning when I'm a bit sort of, hmm, uh, you know, really vague, not enough coffee, and all that kind of thing. And it's like, and maybe I'm just going to use this slightly and deliberately naive David Byrne, Laurie Anderson voice. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm making friends with Laurie Anderson right now. And it's, a, it's quite charming how the way she likes to think, talk about things and, and like the way that I like to write about things. It's quite sort of similar. Um, and um, then, you know, in the afternoon, when you've got a bit more speed going, um, you can be all passion and intense. I'm right and you're wrong. And, you know, I'm writing a book for Verso now. This is all about solidarity with non-human people. And, um, it's, it's, in a way, it's exactly the same because it's Tim's stupid ideas, right? But, like, the, this is a very, very different book that's ho hopefully lots of people will read, read it. I, I feel like one thing that people like me think about that is that we're appealing to a wider audience, and that's the most condescending thing I ever heard in my life. As far as I'm concerned, what, what Penguin have got me to do here from day one has been so much more sophisticated than anything in my academic world, which is to do with authority, right? Like, you write this book, it gets sent off to a press, some other person in some other monastery called a university rubber stamps it with the imprimatur, and then, you know, it's official, and then you can publish it, right? But in uh, Penguin World, they want you to interact with them because they realise, like, they're the reader, and you're the reader. You're, when you're the writer, you're the reader, right? So you start based on this idea of trusting, right? And, and that's really different than appealing to a wider audience because that means you don't trust the people that you're reading, who are reading you at all, right? And... Um, it means that you think believe means hold on really tightly for grim death, right? There's all these different d beliefs about belief, yeah? Um, I think belief could mean the opposite, right? It, 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 it could mean trusting, right? And maybe um, learning to trust ourselves, learning how to handle ourselves with all of this new information that we know, you know, like how to live it is, is, is really key right now. Yeah, so I'm... I'm so keen on that, you know. Well, this is the perfect point at which to open it out to the audience. Um, so, please do uh, give us your name uh, before you ask a question. I've got a gentleman already in the back. Uh, we might take a couple uh, to start us off. If anyone else has a question, uh, we'll take um, the gentleman also here. Um, you don't have to be a man to ask a question. So, uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> third question over there. So, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, Danica McCarthy, Climate Media Coalition. I found the talk really unhelpful. Um, first of all, the basis of your thesis is that the media are shouting at us about climate change. The stats aren't telling us that. Something like over 85% of British newspapers deny climate change is happening or fighting actively to block us taking action. So therefore I fear that thesis on, is un, unhelpful. Maybe for the 200,000 Guardian readers, but not for the vast majority of the public. And secondly, your thesis about responsibility, personal responsibility, not, not driving a car shouldn't make you guilty. Well, that's the complete antithesis of what Gandhi says. Gandhi says, be the change you wish to see in the world. If we don't take responsibility, we have no ethical uh, right or justification or effectiveness in, in getting the message that we need to take urgent action for the terrible disaster that we're facing. So I, don't, I find your contribution quite unhelpful, to be frank with you. That's cool. Thank you. Um, I, I, should we, um, yeah. well, <clears throat> can we, yeah. would you mind if we took the other two questions? Yes. And, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll yes. um, you said at one point that um, you shouldn't talk about we. I was rather curious, and particularly in the context of yeah. yours, then going on to suggest that the whole was less than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And then the third question over here. Is it on? Okay, now it's on. Um, hi, uh, Lucy Latham. I work for a charity that bridges art and culture and climate change. Um, and we work with arts organisations and they, and they ask us what to do. They say, we want to do work in this. We don't know how to do it. We don't have much resource. We don't have much time. So we create fact sheets and guides and information and facts. 
what is a way to still give that knowledge in a way that a building manager will still see as practical, but A, gives the audience uh, enough trust that they can also, uh, that they know that we're in ecological crisis and they can use that knowledge to create their own uh, perceptions and realities and action. Does that make sense? Well, it makes perfect sense. Thank you. Um, Do you want to start with that one and work may back? I? Yes, yeah. I would like to start with that one because like, um, I feel very, very inhibited to, to, to tell you to do something different. Um, and in fact, um, quite a lot of how I like to think about things is very much like against the idea of how we think that, what, 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 what that means, doing something different, you know. Um, and also because what you're doing is so like specialized and like bespoke and like directed at particular people, you know. Um, whereas sort of what I'm talking about is like the kind of because it's all I can cope with. It's like the sort of bottom of the barrel, my idea of your idea, of her idea, of their idea, of their, their idea of my idea about stuff. Like this really vague ass, like kind of record store version of ecology. It's got nothing to do with like the incredibly important practical stuff. And of course, you know, the point about global warming is it should be stopped immediately, right? Like it's incredibly obvious, like stop emitting carbon. Everybody stop driving cars. You know, everybody stop, you know, all that stuff, right? Like, I live in Houston where a lot of the fossil fuels are refined, and we had this massive uh, hurricane, um, and it, the first thing that happened was this very strong smell of gasoline something from somewhere. No one's going to admit where it is, so I really don't need to know, like, I don't need to be told that, you know, this is a mad, wrong situation, because it's actually, like, probably killing my kids and causing cancer to me and, and as well as like mass extinction to other beings, right? Um, so I, I really, really know, like, like the actual thing to do is to transmogrify society into one that genuinely takes ecological stuff to be like an essential part of it. And that means assuming that non-human beings are always already part of social space, which means that social space was never really human in the first place, you know? Um, so it's incredibly urgent, right? Um, and the interesting thing, of course, as, as the first question was pointing out, is like, how come so many people, like, that's the context of it, like, how come so many people don't, you know? And, and, and so, like, just for a laugh, maybe, I'm taking responsibility for that fact. It's like, um, someone got into terrible trouble on the radio um, when Nixon resigned um, in New York City. One of my friends was telling me because he was there. And they were doing this phone in, and he said, well, of course, you know, like, we're all responsible. We all did this. Nixon is our problem. You know, and the, everyone piled on him at the end, like, oh, my God, you know. Um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky, you know. And the, and the trouble is that um, um, one of the ways we like to think about ecology is a little bit like how we like to think about evil, you know. Like, evil is this thing over there. Like, if only I could get rid of the evil, then everything would be great. Right, like that, that sort of like Nazi mode, really. It's sort of like, I'm just, if we just get rid of this really wrong symptom, like everything will be perfect, right? But in any ecosystem, there's always going to be something wrong for somebody, you know, because like, you know, if you're going to be nice to bunny rabbits, it means you're not going to be nice to bunny rabbit predators, right? So you can never get it completely right, because there's always going to be some kind of virus or bacteria or shark or something that wants to kill you in some way, you know? And so it's sort of like, um, there's no way to be completely perfect. And so, in a way, hypocrisy is where it's at in ecological awareness. You just like, realize with greater and greater whatever that, that, that everything you do has this kind of limit to it and that everything you do is kind of like hypocrite in a way, right? And so um, it's funny because at the same time as immediately galvanizing people to work in, with tremendous passion on this, there's another thing to do as well, which is like, like figure out like how we how we have a conversation about how we're doing it, how we're talking to ourselves about it, you know, um, at the same time, and that and, that, and that's the bit that I'm that I'm talking to, um, and, and and I've been saying we a lot um, in my line of work, which is human, humanistic scholarship. Um, me and my friend Depeche Chakrabarti have been banned from quite a lot of journals actually because. Um, we talking at this scale sounds to many people who work in our, er, our areas of history, of philosophy, whatever, uh, um, as like universalistic 
generalizations, you know, obviously defaulting to like white mansplaining, you know, even Depeche, right? Um, and um, so the difficulty is like we've like figured out a way of like never being able to talk at the scale that is appropriate to thinking this problem, you know. Um, and how to say we without sounding like that, you know, that's like a key, that's key, you know. Um, and so I, I, I sort of try, try my best to think about how to do that. So if I can push you though on the, on the, on the first challenge. Yeah. So are you saying that it's, you're not yeah. diminishing the need or the power of individual responsibility and action? Not at all. But you're just saying that's not enough? Um, no, it's because more like, yeah, it's, it, it, it's not enough in terms of like, you're right, it's not enough. Like, um, if you only work in guilt mode, you're scaling what you're doing to like affecting individuals, right? Whereas this other mode might be about talking to larger groups. You know, that's actually a good way of putting it. Um, and um, there's various other things that you, you could say as well, I think. Well, let's get some more questions. We've got one over uh, on the front here. Um, and, well, we're all the way over there. <laughs> the second one, perhaps we'll just take those two. Go ahead. Hi, it's Hetal Jani, I'm an intern here at the RSA. Um, so you say that guilt doesn't, shouldn't really play a part in this kind of wider <laughs> way of solving climate change. But don't you think, for example, obviously Western countries are, have contributed more to climate change. So in the, in the kind of global debate, they can be like, we did cause it more, so yeah. we should, even we can help kind of yeah. more developing countries find ways to, right. to lessen so, climate and, change. And, and that's not guilt, is it? That's like taking responsibility for something that's really happened. Yeah, but can that really yeah. happen without guilt? Yeah. Because I didn't do it. I didn't do that. I did not destroy Earth. I really didn't. And, and, and neither did you. The, 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 the other thing that needs to be said here is that just because Americans invented air conditioning doesn't make them more evil than the people who want it next, right? Like, just because Americans did something first doesn't make them evil. That, that's like a kind of original sin problem there. Right? I say this as a hypocritical American dude. Can you tell? I have, this, have a souvenir accent. <laughs> Dual citizen. Um, and there was a question over here. Uh, Mike Thompson from Good Brand. Uh, thanks, Tim. A really uh, a question about how you would respond to, for example, the intercontinental, uh, sorry, intergovernmental panel for climate change and various pronouncements that we frequently get, which yeah. is presented as very hard data, yes. very much true, false yes. paradigm, yeah. um, and a little bit frightening. Yes. So could you help us how you yes. handle that? I think about that a lot. Um, and I'd like to start an organization, we can all be members of it, um, called the IPCC, um, Intraplanetary Concerned Critters. Yeah? And the idea is that when, they, when, there's a next, when there's the next IPCC press conference, we're going to do another one parallel, right, and we're going to sit there with, like, animal hats on, you know, and, like, just w freak people out. We're not going to do any facts at all. We're just going to sort of slightly amaze people. Um, and it, so far, it's just, like, me and Björk. I don't know who else is in it. <laughs> but, like, we're, you're very welcome to come. And, like, we'll have this table and we'll sit there and we'll do a funny thing, right? And so, like, that, that's the trouble. The poor scientist who's sitting behind there has never been trained how to realize that like the delivery mode that they're in you know needs to be really carefully thought about right and the trouble is and I'm gonna really peep some people off now it really is it really does default to a belief competition the way they talk and the way we let them talk is a setup that totally involves like my belief is better than yours and that means you need to replace your belief with my belief right if that's what's going on, then it's never going to work. Like my son, Simon, he got in the playground and, you know, it's Texas, right? Houston is an incredibly racially diverse and religiously diverse city. Nevertheless, somebody said, do you believe in God? And he said, no. And this is a couple of weeks ago. And the guy was like, um, well, then you're evil and I can't be your friend, you know? And I said to Simon, I said, well, next time somebody asks you that, um, maybe you can say, before we start talking, can we talk first about what believe means what does it mean to you the word believe you know let's have a conversation about that first before we get into you know so yeah in, in a funny way it's really not helpful and deliberately 
what I'm doing. I'm really not trying to be, like, if helpful means go from A to B really efficiently in my head. Yeah, that's, what, that's exactly the opposite of what I'm doing. I'm an irritating bastard. <laughs> How would the world be different, Tim, for you, if everybody could achieve, you know, what, what you recommend at the end, which is to realise that, to notice what we already are. We are ecological, to, th to think in different ways, to, mm. to, to have this different kind of conversation. Mm. Um, because there's a sort of... Uh, mm. what, I'm, what, what I suppose everybody asks you for and you're not willing to, to probably provide is some sense of how anything might change. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, how they might change or how the world might look different or how... Well, I mean, would, would if, if, we, uh, if everyone on the planet read your book and absorbed it, or mm. similar ones, uh, would you expect us to ch behave differently? Would, mm. Might we avoid a serious sixth mass extinction? You know, what might change as a result yeah. of realising that we are ecological and behaving yeah. and feeling and thinking in that way? I'm sort of... I'm, well, of course, my hope is that this is Tim's way of contributing to something like that. Right. Um, you know, the fact that it's already started doesn't mean that we can't try to stop it or that thinking that it's just inevitable so we have to learn how to adapt to it is the only real way, you know. Um, the, um, the thing to remember is that when you're, when you're doing something right, it might feel really weird. You know, like you, you, can't, you, you don't necessarily get rubber stamped by the situation when it's while it's happening and happening here means for the next hundred thousand years on the big 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 scale right so we might not like really know what the hell we're doing for a bit you know um, and there might be a tremendous sense of, of irony about that it's like that in apocalypse now you know like when the guy comes out of the Martin Sheen comes out of the sort of water with this camo, camo on and he's gonna assassinate Kurtz and he's like they were gonna make me a major for this and I wasn't even in their army anyway, anymore, or something like that. It sort of feels like that, right? Um, that the structures that we have for coping with it aren't quite right, because they, 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 they didn't take it into account. You know, and this is all really, really new, you know. And, like, my one skill, maybe, is, like, helping people to get over the shock mode. You know, like, maybe just, like, very, in a very limited way, like within the next few years, maybe we can start to be let, a little bit less like in, in shock mode mm. about it. Because like the worst thing you can do to someone whose mum just died is, don't you realise your mum just died, you stupid wanker? Like that's obviously never going to really help, right? And so like, 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 tr like Trump voters do feel shame. Like there's this idea like Republicans are shameless. They're not. They, do, they bloody well know that they're wrong. Right, like, like a real fundamentalist really wouldn't care what people in San Francisco and New York or Houston, for that matter, thought about them, right? They really wouldn't care. These guys seem to care a lot, right? And so they get super, super triggered. You know, they're the snowflakes, right? Like, how to deal with those guys, you know? And um, upside the head slapping hasn't... Well, like, it's hoovered up as many people as it's going to hoover up. Right, so like this is like, like trying to do a different kind of Hoover, you know, Le a, a less strong one. It's like the anti-Dyson Hoover. <laughs> it's like a really lame-ass Hoover, you know. Good. Well, I'm afraid we are we are out of time, uh, but it, but it seems that if you're sitting there and, and, and you're feeling slightly traumatised or a bit weird, then that's a good start. Uh, and, and if you want to get the whole hog, uh, Tim is going to stay behind and will be available to sign books should you want to. I want to read a book. So. Sorry if we didn't have a chance to ask you questions, uh, but um, please uh, join me in giving Tim Morton a huge thank you.